jumping is allowed. Right? Or, or foot thumping. I think she bumped foot. Some sort of touch. <laughs> Hi, welcome to the Camelback Church and happy Sabbath. We're glad you're worshiping with us. We have a pretty good sized crowd here at church today. Um, it is a wonderful place to come visit. We do social distance and mass, so if uh, you feel uh, healthy enough and want to join us, this is a good place to come back to. We have a wonderful program today. Elder Lama King is going to come and share, his, share the, the word with us, and, and uh, we're glad that you are with us at home. Um, I'm going to put the scripture up here on the line. Our call to worship today is from Psalms 34, 1 through 3. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Pray with me today. Father in heaven, I thank you again for this wonderful time we can be together and worship freely today. Be with our country, be with our leaders, be with our church, and be with Camelback and its members and families today as we rejoice in your great name. We thank you for Jesus Christ and ask the presence of your Holy Spirit to be with us today and fill us. And we thank you for Jesus again in his great name we say amen. amen. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sabbath. In a world with so much unrest, it's really good to be in the house of the Lord today. It's good to know that we have a Lord that saves. His hand has not gotten short, right? We have a Lord that saves. So I want to invite you through your masks if you can and if you want to, to join me in this song, Jesus Saves, Jesus Saves. We have heard a joyful sound, Jesus saves, Jesus saves, spread the gladness all around, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Good morning, children and children at heart, both here in the sanctuary and those watching live or with the recording online. Um, I'm really excited to share a story with you this morning. My name is Sarah, and I want you to imagine a very different place in your mind. Close your eyes if you have to. We're going to be transported from the desert to a forest this morning. 
this forest has lots of trees. They're typically really green, but it's fall now. So those leaves are turning yellow and red and orange. There's lots of streams. There's lots of rivers, babbling brooks, crashing creeks. There are lots of critters in this forest. In fact, let's call this forest Fenton Forest. Let me tell you about Fenton Forest. It's based on a place where I actually grew up in Tennessee. And when I was young, my pastor would share fables from Fenton Forest. Now, these were really awesome lessons and stories for people of all ages. So I wanna share one with you this morning. And I wanna introduce you to this cast of characters in Fenton Forest. We have come upon an argument between Freddy Fox and Anthony Ant. Now this isn't really new. Freddy and Anthony are always trying to disagree about something, but today their voices are getting really loud. You know, Anthony Ant, his yell isn't quite as loud as Freddy Fox's, but soon people are gathering around. What are they arguing about today? Listen, Anthony Ant tells Freddy, I don't need glasses to see what's right in front of me. I went to school, I know my plants. This mushroom, it has a rough surface. It has bumps all over it. Freddy Fox looks down at Anthony Ant and the mushroom and says, I don't have to go to school to know that this mushroom has a smooth surface. You're wrong. This is so smooth and you are blind. You just don't understand what you're talking about. Well, their voice is raised and the critters gather around. What, what is going on? Why can't they get along? You know, they always seem to be arguing about something. And, you know, maybe it kind of started around the time when uh, Freddie Fox was building a den for his family and Anthony decided to build a nest inside his den. But, you know, that was a long time ago. They still keep fighting. Can you believe it? So, all of a sudden, wise old owl starts to circle the gathering and he comes upon Anthony Ant and Freddie Fox. Listen, what are you guys arguing about? Well, they, too, they, they start to explain, well, this mushroom is smooth. No, this is bumpy. And he holds up a hand or a feather, I guess, a wing. <laughs> And wise old owl takes his wing and bends the mushroom over. Oh, now everybody around can see this mushroom is both smooth and rough. They were both right. Oh, well, I'll be, says Anthony Ant. I guess I uh, just needed to see the whole mushroom. Uh, me too, said Freddy Fox. Mm, all of the cr woodland creatures gathered around, nodded their heads like, yep. Now we can see the whole, whole view. Wise old owl also nodded his head and he told everybody gathered, you know, when you get to see both sides of something, you generally don't yell as loud. Nobody said much and they went about their business back into Finn Forest. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for always being there for us and giving us a new view on our own lives and help remind us that oftentimes we just have a small, small view and, and we need you and your Holy Spirit to broaden it. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Good morning, church family. Mm, yes, you guys are awake this morning. Um, I'm Tori, for those of you guys that don't know me. Um, I've just gotten in from Bolivia last night slash this morning. And this time, I've shared with you guys a few times about the mission work that we're doing down in Bolivia, but this time I brought some friends with me. Um, well, they're more like family than friends. Um, we have Miguel and Tara Tello, and they're our directors down at our project down there and they're here to share about some of the things that we've been doing down there. Good morning again, happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. It is truly a blessing to be here with you um, in Tori's home church, enjoying your beautiful weather. Um, I am the director of Ebenezer. We have a boarding academy in a children's home. 
in the middle of 220 acres in the jungle, where we attend um, students, children who have come from abusive situations principally. About 80% of our students have come from uh, physically, sexually, um, emotionally abused situations, abandonment, uh, both in the academy and in the children's home. And our goal is to provide a place where they can find a safe haven, where they can come to know Christ and allow him to heal their wounds, physical sometimes, but more often spiritual, mental, and emotional. And I just want to share a couple of pictures with you. This is our family this year. This is our second year that we've been functioning uh, as a new project. We had 11 students last year. This year we had 28. Our students are in the blue shirts. Our staff is in the black. Um, and this is an aerial shot of our campus. Uh, all the buildings that you see there have all been built in the last two and a half years, uh, which is a lot down there where we are. And that is um, thanks to, in part, a lot of the support that you and your church provide us. So we wanted to let you know that we really, really appreciate it. Uh, it means more than you know, and it helps more than you realize. Uh, one of our kids is here with us. Kevin is over here with Cindy, our son from Bolivia. Um, so you can um, see him later. and. We're happy to share some of the experiences, but we just wanted you to know that God's love really does change people. It changes hearts, it changes lives, and the students learn that it doesn't matter what past they've had, that doesn't define them. God defines them. They find their identity in Christ, and they're no longer limited by circumstances or comments or situations that others have done for them. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to my wife and let her share kind of where we're heading from here. And this is Tara. Good morning, church. So God has shown us over and over again that this is his project as he keeps opening doors uh, to win young people for him in Bolivia. And I guess I could say that 2020 has not been without its challenges. I think everyone here could say the same. Um, it has affected us here, there, everywhere, and it's been a hard year. Um, between the worldwide pandemic and some accidents that happened this year on campus and in our neighboring communities, the idea of a second phase of Ebenezer has been placed on our hearts. Um, we believe that God is opening the door to build the Ebenezer Lifestyle Center. We've already received applications from an ER nurse, uh, or excuse me, an ER doctor, a lab tech, a nurse, a physical therapist, and this is probably the first time that we've had staff in place before we've had a building in which they can serve. So our vision for Ebenezer Phase 2 is multifaceted. We want the place to be somewhere where guests can come to participate in lifestyle health programs similar to what you would do at New Start at Weimar. Uh, secondly, even when the Lifestyle Center is not in session, we would like it to be a place of rest and relaxation where individuals can come to get away and uh, to find the rest only Christ can give. And finally, we would like to have a small outpatient medical and dental clinic to assist rural, rural families and our Ebenezer School family with basic men, uh, medical and dental needs. Perhaps the clinic could even serve as a beacon of hope during future epidemics or pandemics. But most importantly, we want the center to be a place where people will fall in love with Jesus as they experience his physical, mental, and spiritual healing. We're counseled to take hold of the medical missionary work, and it will give you access to the people. Their hearts will be touched as you minister to their necessities. As you relieve their sufferings, you will find opportunity to speak to them of the love of Jesus. And really, that's what it's all about. Mm -hmm. We want them to fall in love with Jesus. So if you feel so inclined, we invite you to consider contributing financially. But more importantly, we invite you to join us in praying for God's guidance in this new phase of Ebenezer. Thank you. Please pray for us. There's a lot of challenges um, every day, not just with the students, but in the community. Like she said, we've had several medical incidents this year, chainsaw accidents, machete accidents, um, you know, that require <clears throat> health care that isn't readily available where we are in the jungle. And so God is, like she said, opening the doors, and we want to move forward in faith and try to reach a different uh, population than we've been able to do so far because we know that Christ is coming soon, and we want to finish the work and get the gospel preached to as many people as possible so that we can hasten the coming of our Lord. Thank you so much for having us. Enjoy your Sabbath, and may God bless you. Good morning again, church. It's a beautiful Sabbath when you could be in church. That's the new normal. <laughs> If you could bake it to the church and be in the building, it's a happy Sabbath. 
Uh, many of you have seen me before, but my wife, Angela, can we all say welcome? Thank you. Good to be here. Hey, you'll be close to the microphone. Oh. She is my better half. I'm the fortunate half. And we are here to represent our Three Angels Broadcasting Network family. Just real quickly, kind of give you some statistics, because many people believe that, um, or think I work for, or I'm hired by 3AB, and actually I'm a pastor in the Illinois Conference, but I have been working, I've been in pastoral ministry for 33 years, I've been ordained a number of years ago, began our ministry in California, then Iowa, Missouri Conference, now the Illinois Conference, but I work along with 3ABN as a pastor of the church, but also in a number of other capacities. John and I have done programming together. You've seen me in different capacities, from singing to preaching to teaching, and that's kind of how it happens. But my wife is a full-time employee of 3ABN, and I wanted to kind of share with you some things about the ministry. Uh, let me just ask a question. How many of you watch, have seen 3ABN before? Raise your hands. Okay, praise the Lord. And um, we can say amen to that, honey, amen? amen. Yeah, we'll say amen to you. Yeah, thank you. We have been blessed to be a part of that ministry. Our journey is one that, as we lived in California, we never thought that we would be a part of a ministry. We didn't ask to be there, but the Lord opened the doors and invited us to come, and here we are today in many capacities. But the ministry began 36 years ago. Uh, the founder and the president for many, many years is Danny Shelton. He started that ministry in a vision. The Lord one day impressed him when he asked, Father, where are we in the media? And he had a vision to build a television station, as he said, one that would reach the world with the undiluted three angels' messages. And when he, when he sought way, one that will counteract the counterfeit. You stand closer to that because, yeah, one that will counteract the counterfeit. And having that vision, through the years, step by step by step, 3ABN has become what it is today. It's a television station that's on 24 hours a day, seven days a week on one form of media or the other. We have nine networks, uh, the 3ABN English Channel. We have the Dear to Dream, which is the urban network, which right now Jason Bradley is the general manager, his mom, who's Danny Shelton's wife, Yvonne Lewis Shelton. She started that. We also have the Kids Time Network, which is uh, under the new direction now of Francine Bergman. We have 3ABN French, 3ABN Latino, 3ABN Proclaim, which is sermons all day long. For those that just want to watch sermon after sermon after sermon, it's not the same person, but it has sermons all day long. Then we have 3ABN Russia, the largest remaining Christian ministry in the ex-Soviet Union is a 250,000 square foot worship center that 3ABN built shortly after the walls came down and they're the only one that lasted since then. Can you say amen to that? They have received so many awards in media in Russia from, from border to border, very creative. Uh, from, they have Russian television, Russian radio, production that's phenomenal. We have also 3ABN International, which covers a lot of Europe outside of the United States. Then we have a music television channel, 3ABN Praise Him. Anything you want to add to that, honey? No, no. You got to be close to the microphone. <laughs> okay. You're doing good. <laughs> okay. We have uh, the ways you can watch 3ABN. We're on Dish Network. Yes. We're on Verizon. We're on the Fire Stick TV. If you don't know what that is, ask one of the young people. They know what that is. We have uh, Truly, Truly TV. We have Vision TV. We have YouTube TV. We're on Verizon Fios, uh, Comcast Cable. We're on Roku. We're on My SDA TV, which is a which is a box that was developed by Moses Primo, the head engineer for Three Angels Broadcasting Network, which you can plug it in to the internet, record programming while you're away, and come back and watch it two or three weeks down the road. Uh, it's on demand. We also have Facebook television for 3ABN, and then we have a phone app. How many of you have heard of a cell phone? <laughs> it's a very new device created not too long ago by some very ingenious individuals. If you go to the Apple Store 
or the um, Android Play Store. You can download, just put in 3ABN or 3Angels Broadcasting, and you can download in here, watch all the networks, watch and listen to radio, which I'm going to give my wife some time now to talk about 3ABN Radio, because it has a number of components. Uh, I'll get that worked on. It has a number of components where you can listen to and watch the networks. Just download the app. It's free. It doesn't cost you anything. Honey? Good morning and happy Sabbath. I bring you greetings from 3ABN Radio Network. Jay Christian is the manager, and it's only five of us that work there. We have Mike Babb, who's the engineer. We, he's from Portland, Oregon, but the Lord brought us all together from different parts of the world for radio network. And Jay Christian was also from uh, Washington State. And we have Kevin Polin, he's one of the editors. Jennifer Todd, who is Jay Christian's assistant. And myself, who I'm an editor, and I host a radio program called Crossroads. So I'm, I'm looking for people that have an interesting story to tell for radio, that have a testimony. We have millions of listeners that listen to radio. We're very large in Australia, and we have over 300 stations worldwide. And we are also big in Michigan, quite a lot of listeners in Michigan. We have a radio affiliate called Strong Tower Radio, and they have, uh, wow. Anyway, they're trying to get a station in Detroit right now, but right now we have, they reach all the way over to Canada. I'm gonna share one quick story with you. There was a lady that was listening to 3ABN radio on the dial. She was just listening to the station, not an Adventist, and she kept, she says, oh, I don't wanna hear about this Sabbath thing, and she turned the dial, turned it, pressed the button, turned, it went right back to 3ABN radio. <laughs> and she said, why is it going back? And she started listening. She said, wow, I never heard that. She said, this is interesting. This is in the Bible about the Sabbath. And she listened again. And then she said, I'm not gonna listen anymore. And she turned it off, turned, turned the channel, turned the station, and she went, it went right back to 3ABN radio. And she said, what is going on? She said, is this someone? At 3ABN Radio, a strong tower changing the channel for Matter of fact, she called the station and said, would you stop changing my radio? <laughs> he said, we're not doing it. Praise God, she is now a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. Amen. To God be the glory. And we could tell you story after story after story. Oh, yeah. But this is just, radio is the theater of the mind. We have truckers that are listening to 3ABN Radio, and they have to pull over because they're hearing the health message. They're hearing uh, the, the word of God like they've never heard before. Right. And many people are walking into, even in our local church, because of 3ABN Radio. Download that app, 3ABN. You could do it right now. Um, download the okay, app. Okay, where's you your cell phone? 3ABN. <laughs> Everybody have a cell phone, right? <laughs> and, and you can download the app. We even have a 3ABN Radio music channel. 24 hours a day, you That's can right. listen to 3ABN music. And it's better than, it's better than yeah, Apple Pan Music or Pandora, Pandora because you can hear ours on any continent, yeah, whereas you that. can't with Apple TV, Apple Music, or Pandora. Yeah. They're just for the United States, but ours is free and it's international. That's right, ours is free. So you can listen to um, radio anywhere in the world. We were in, um, where were we? All over, last year, we, anyway, we're in Africa, in um, Nairobi, Kenya, and we, Ruku, was it, not Ruku, Pandora. I couldn't listen to Pandora. You know what I did? Let me click 3ABN radio. All you need is internet. And I put my 3ABN radio, and it was so nice to hear our music channel. So anyway, God bless you. And we know that this gospel shall be preached into where? All the world. And what's going to happen? Our Lord will come. Praise God. Amen. Amen. I'm proud of, I'm proud of my wife. Years ago, she wouldn't do this. She would not be up front. I'm still but, nervous. But, but, she's, but she's a proud member of Toastmasters. And uh, so she's, that's not an advertisement. We're talking about 3ABN. 
but, um, but praise the Lord. We are left and right hand together. But I want you to also pray. Recently, we had a, a tragedy. We lost one of the former general managers, Molly Steenson. If you've watched 3ABN before or you have a call in, that's the voice on the phone. Molly Steenson succumbed to cancer and lost that battle. Matter of fact, and also in my former life uh, as a member of the Heritage Singers, uh, Max Mace recently lost his battle to cancer. So pray for that ministry also. And, uh, but if you want to find out anything more about 3ABN, just go to 3ABN.tv or 3ABN.org and you'll be able to connect with all that God has been able to bless our ministry with. Yes. And right now, thank you, honey, we have undertaken a campaign to get the three angels messages to the entire world and a couple of years ago i wrote a booklet called the three angels messages in summary what i'd like you to do is go to the website go to 3abn.org or go to the store and you'll find out ways that you can sponsor the project now do you think that the three angels messages is important it's our message for this day we have, we have made the evangelistic series one of the most affordable ones you can ever participate in. 200 booklets for only $21, the cost of shipping. If you want to participate in that, go to the 3ABN website and you'll find out more about that. And may God bless you as we seek to do what the Lord has called us to do. And I'm going to end this. First, I'm going to escort my wife down. And I'm going to, no, she said she's okay, but I'm a gentleman. I'm teaching the guys how to be a gentleman. This song simply summarizes what we do. Our aim and our goal is to allow the gospel to touch the people all over the world once again. We need wisdom. We need power, true love for each other. We have had so many big but empty words. So we come before your face, asking for your grace. Bring your people to a state of kingdom life. Restore your church again. Touch your people once again With your precious holy hand We pray Let your kingdom shine upon this earth Through a living and glorious church not for temporary deeds, but to restore authority and power. Let a mighty rushing wind roll in and touch your people once again. Lord, you see your tired servants and your broken, wounded soldiers. Oh, how much we need your precious healing hand. We need the power of the cross as the only source for us when we stand to take our final battle cry. Restore your church again touch your people once again with your precious holy hand we pray let your kingdom shine upon this earth through a living and glorious church not for temporary deeds, 
but to restore authority and power. Let a mighty rushing wind blow in and touch your people once again. Let a mighty rushing wind blow Touch your people once again. Good morning, church. Uh, today's offering will be going to the Global Mission Pioneers. Uh, Prem received medical training and then chose to live in a small steepend in a remote town in India as a global missionary pioneer. Before Prem arrived, there were no Adventists in the region. The nearest hospital is several, several hours away, so Pioneer Prem used the talents God has given him to serve the town sick. He transformed his living room into a clinic where he lovingly teaches the locals how to adopt a holistic lifestyle and treats their illnesses. Then he prays for the heavenly physician to heal and bless them. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, uh, please bless this offering and please bless the speaker today and please help those who couldn't make it and in your name, amen. Let us pray again. Dear Father, thank you for my blessings. Uh, please be with the people that are sick. Please heal them. Uh, please be with the pastor while he preaches. And thank you that Sabbath. And in your name, amen. Good morning and happy Sabbath, church family. Today's scripture reading will be from Luke 22, 31 through 32, and I'll be reading from the New King James Version. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. May the Lord add his blessing to his word. Thank you. Good to be here, church. Beautiful spirit and just uh, a time to worship the Lord together. Uh, we need this, don't we? I'm here to introduce Pastor John Lomakang. We have uh, known each other for about almost 25 years. Uh, initially, he was my pastor. But over time, uh, the Lord worked it out where we were seeing that our ministry, or at least our our the way we thought and processed and talked about things was very similar. And in fact, uh, we mentioned this story last night that we had at one point said, wouldn't it be great if we could actually have a show or a program where we could answer Bible questions and talk about the Lord? And then sitting there on a house calls set uh, years later, the reality set in, we're doing what we asked for. And so it has been a blessing not only to, uh, to know and appreciate John and Angie as friends, but um, to have them here after, you know, a few, quite a few years apart. Uh, we were there in Illinois, initially in Thompsonville for a couple years, but then uh, Rochelle and I moved to Springfield, Illinois, pastored there for five years before heading over to Washington State. But... Uh, but still stay in touch all the time and love what they're doing as they continue to minister through 3ABN and him at the church. Uh, John, thank you so much for being here uh, from the bottom of my heart. And we look forward maybe to having them back next year. 3ABN had given me, it wasn't a promise, but they said, you know what, we had to cancel the rally this year. We'll come back and we'll bring it to you next year, God willing. So uh, what you're going to hear now is uh, Pastor John Loma Kang with another song for us and then his message. Thank you, John. Amen. 
Yes, it's so good to be in the house of the Lord. John is my big brother. <laughs> Literally, exactly. People would say to me, when they see me around church, they say, you're tall. I said, no, I'm on my way to be tall. He's tall. And I'd always have fun with that. But uh, what a blessing it is to be able to see you in church on Sabbath morning here in Arizona. They call Florida the Sunshine State. After driving around, I'm going to campaign for them to call Arizona the Sunshine State. Because we've enjoyed, my wife and I have been driving around saying, wow, we could live here. If, being, if moving here, if one of the standard pieces of equipment is you have to own a Bentley, we may not move here. <laughs> but if that's okay, we'd move here without that. But we have a, John and I are always dreaming about what to do in the future, because eventually we would have to retire from regular ministry, so we're conjuring up something. But by God's grace, he will always work things out for us. After being married for 37 years and in ministry 33 years, my wife and I have learned that the secret of keeping our lives strong is allowing the Lord to be the foundation of everything that we decide to do. Uh, we have grown together. We have a saying, we would rather fight than switch. And my wife is Jamaican, born in England, but she's of Jamaican descent. And if you've been married more than 10 years or 20 years or 30 years, you know you'd rather fight than switch is a good statement. Because I said, if she's this beautiful on this side of earth, on this side of heaven, what's she going to look like when she gets to there? So I'm holding on because I love this version, and then I'm waiting for the next version. <laughs> so, yeah. <clears throat> Periodically, I sit back, and my wife said, why are you looking at me that way? I said, honey, you're beautiful. And I just want to let the guys know if I just say this, take it the way that it falls. I try to say it the right way. Some guys polish their cars, wash their cars, put all that nice stuff on the tires and make the tires glisten. They vacuum it out. I've often said as a marriage counselor of many years, if you treat your wife half as nicely as you treat your car, She'll take you places your car could never go. <laughs> and that's, try to be kind on that one. <laughs> Amen, ladies. Do me a favor, brother. Just bring me up just a touch more in the monitor on my mic here and a little bit in the house. I want to save my voice for the sermon. This morning, I want to talk about a topic that I believe will transform the way you think about chains in Scripture. The way you think about God's plan for your life, the way you think about victory, the way you think about how God works at different times and different intervals in your life. But before I do that, I want to sing a song that um, summarizes why we're here. We want you to know the Lord. We want you to have a relationship with the Lord. And this song brings that to the forefront very, very clearly. If the ship of your life is tossing on the sea of strife, you need someone. If you feel so all alone and your house is not a home, you need someone. If you feel life isn't fair and there's no one left to share all those lonely days and nights when things just won't turn out right and you want someone to share and someone to just be there, 
perfect love that casteth out all fear. I give you Jesus. He's the water that you'll drink and never thirst again. I give you My friends, I give you Jesus. Listen. If the pressure's all around, keep your spirits to the ground. You need someone. And if your body is in pain and your health you can't regain, you need someone. If the times that you have tried with all the strength you have inside, but it seems that you have failed, Remember on the cross he's nailed all that bitterness and grief to give you peace and sweet relief. He is the someone that you need. So I give you Jesus. He's the peace that passes all understanding. That perfect love that casteth out all fears. I give you Jesus. He's the water that you'll drink but never thirst again. I give you Jesus. My I give you Jesus. He's everything. He's the one we need. I give you Jesus, my friends. Yes, I give you Jesus. Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, what a blessing it is to be able to know that the answer for the challenges of life still today is Jesus. Father, right now we invite your spirit to continue with us, to take our minds to the place that you know it needs to be for the surgery that you intend to do today to be accomplished on each of these human hearts. Strengthen our minds that we may see that which right now may become vague and opaque to us and that your word will come to life and begin to lead us into that journey of transformation. And this I ask in the worthy name of Jesus. And all of God's people said, Amen. Breaking the chains. If you want to follow along in the sermon, 
I would encourage you to go to the book of Acts, chapter 12, where the menu can be found. We are going to eat freshly from the Word of God today in, Rome, in Acts, chapter 12. We're going to be covering verses 1 to 16. But let me begin by making a very profound statement. Until your life is a threat to the enemy, it is no use to God. Until your very existence causes the forces of darkness to tremble, it will never cause the forces of light to rejoice. Until Satan wakes up each morning and your name is on his hit list, your existence is very, very vague. And so today I want to make it very clear that our lives, our existence, the choices we make, everything about us can either exist in a mundane way or we can make it abundantly clear that we are on the side of the Lord and we are not on the side of the enemy. Until your life is a threat to the kingdom of darkness, it is no use to the kingdom of life. We've got to make the firm decision. If that keeps happening, I'll use a pulpit microphone. We'll make the, well, I'll use my handheld. Thank you so much. We have to make the firm decision to take our stand with Christ and against the kingdom of darkness. The text that was read earlier, I'd like to repeat that with you. It's found in the book of Luke. This is a sobering text. It takes us to a very sobering place. We read the words, of Jesus to a very misguided, highly enthusiastic fisherman by the name of Peter. The Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen the brethren. On any given day without any prior notice, there may be a conversation between God and Satan about you. Think about it. Because in some sense or the other, each one of us is like Peter in some way or the other. Satan had been stalking Peter's life from the time he was a fisherman until the time he became an ardent apostle, sold out to the kingdom of God. But one day, the devil said to Christ, if you just give me access to Peter, I'll bring him to his knees. When I read that text, I thought about it. And I know in my own life, there were times that I believed that conversation between God and the devil took place about me. Can somebody say Amen. I mean, you know there were days in your life that it, everything just fell apart, seemingly like it will never come back together, and you ask yourself deeply in the recesses of your soul, what just happened? What just happened? The Lord gave the devil access to your life, but praise God, he gave him limitations. You can go this far, but no further. But I like verse 32 because the Lord, in giving the devil access to Peter's life, the devil says, I'm going to sift him as wheat. But I love what the Lord said to Peter in verse 32. But I have prayed for you. Praise God, I am on the prayer list of Jesus Christ. You may be going through difficulty in your life, but it's so good to know. You know, people say, put me on your prayer list. I'm on the prayer list for Jesus. We are on the prayer list of divinity. Can you imagine what Jesus' prayer, prayer list must look like? If he rolled it out, it will cover the earth. Each of us, when we become sons and daughters of God, we are added to the prayer list of Jesus. And by the way, he never sleeps and he never slumbers and he prays for us in the darkest and deepest of times. And what did he pray? He prayed that our faith would not fail. He said to Peter, you're going to go through some stuff. So the question is not whether or not we can trust God. The question is whether or not God can trust us. Somebody once said, I don't have difficulty. I said, because the Lord can't trust you. 
Because the greatest challenge we have is bringing shame to the name of God in the times of our trials. You've heard of those people. They come to church and say, I don't know what God is doing to me. I don't know what I did to God for God to do this to me. They miss one paycheck and they're ready to turn their backs on God. And the Bible says, all that love godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. When I meet people say, when I meet people that say, oh, I've never had trials, I wonder whether or not they're living right. Because unless you face trials, there is no indicator that your life is at all a threat to the kingdom of darkness. But the Lord said to Peter, I pray that your faith will not fail. And I love the way this text ends. He says, and when you have returned to me, or the King James Version says, and when you are converted, strengthen the brethren. Some people can't strengthen other people until they are converted. And the Lord sometimes has to allow us to go through difficulty to get to the point of conversion. But Peter would not have been singled out if his life had not been a threat. Satan would have left Peter alone if Peter left Satan alone. That's why you got to pray for your pastor. I'll say that again. You must have missed that. You got to pray for your pastor. When he's preparing sermons, the devil's looking over his left shoulder. The Lord's looking over his right shoulder saying, keep going, keep going, John, keep going. The devil said, I'm watching you. I, got, I know what you're trying to do on Sabbath morning. Trying to get out of the house, car won't start, runs a red light, get pulled over. The devil tries everything he does to hinder the servant of God from success. But God, I love the fact that he says, when you are converted, and conversion is not joining a church. Conversion is not even getting baptized. Conversion comes somewhere along the way in your walk with Christ. When I was in the Northern California Conference, I won't, I'll be very vague here, but one of the ministers in the Northern California Conference, we were at pastor's meeting, and my ministerial director at the time, the question was asked, when did you experience conversion? And I was shocked when my ministerial director stood up and said, seven years ago. And he had been in the, he had been in the work for that time 40 years. He said, seven years ago, I experienced conversion. So being a member and being a converted son or daughter of God is something altogether different. But the Lord says the benefit to your life would be when you are converted, you can become a strength, a force of good for somebody who's going through difficulty. So pray not just to understand the 28 fundamentals, pray that the Lord will convert you somewhere because in times like these, people need some good news. Amen, somebody. They need to know that though politics is unstable and the economy is unpredictable and the social setting around us is crumbling and religion is on a crash course with politics, somebody ought to be able to stand up in the midst of all this confusion and say, we can still trust our lives to the Lord. Peter would not have been a problem. Peter would not have been a problem had he turned his life over to the Lord. One of my favorite writers points out in Mark one of the reasons that Peter was stumbling because Peter followed the Lord at a distance. Peter followed the Lord at a distance. Peter followed the Lord, according to Ellen White. She says, Peter had a relationship that always kept him at a distance from Christ. If you look at your walk with Christ, something in some of our lives is keeping us at a distance. What does that mean? That means the Lord is here, but you're here. He may be behind you, you're ahead of him. He may be ahead of you, but you're behind him. Peter followed the Lord at a distance. And the day that he denied the Lord, he was following him at a distance. Some people keep Jesus at a distance and wonder why their Christian experience is not what God intended it to be. But Oswald Chambers, one of my favorite writers, talked about this natural devotion. He said, on the January 4th edition of My Utmost for His Highest. And by the way, if you want a powerful devotion, I would strongly recommend My Utmost for His Highest. He says, natural devotion may be all very well to attract us to Jesus, to make us feel his fascination but it will never make us disciples. Natural devotion will always deny Jesus somewhere or the other. Now, why is that? 
When you become a church member, you know, you make declarations to return your tithe and offering and through your life, become a witness or a light to somebody, help them get ready for the, for the coming of the Lord. I was sitting down with Pastor Stanton yesterday at, at brunch, and I was pleased to see his growth, the vision and the mission for this church, not only send you out, but equip you before he sends you out, get you ready to go out. But discipleship and membership are completely different. A member could decide whether or not he or she wants to do right. But you can't be a disciple unless you do right. A member could say, those are not the conditions that I agree to in this conditional relationship with the Lord. But a, but a disciple has to come to the place where he denies himself, where she denies herself. If anyone will be my disciple, let him do what? Deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Peter had a natural devotion. Until he was converted, he was no use. Now, let me add something in here that you're going to see in the story. The day of Pentecost was ahead of Peter when the Lord said that Satan desires to sift you as wheat. It was way ahead of him. This is something Peter didn't know. The Lord had Peter already scheduled to be the speaker on the day of Pentecost. Now grab that. The Lord said, when the day of Pentecost comes, I'm looking for somebody with a big mouth. And that's Peter. But I got to get his mind and his mouth synchronized. So in order to synchronize his mind and mouth together, I'm going to put him through some stuff. And there's nobody better to put him through some stuff than to let the devil heat it up a little bit. Now, you might, seem that's, you might think that's odd, but the Apostle Paul says that there are those who just can't get it together, and he says, commit such a one to Satan that he may buffet him that in the end, his flesh may be saved. Sometimes the Lord has to back away from us to get our attention. Have you ever experienced that? Sometimes the Lord has to back away from people that don't want to be near to him. And on the other side of that, they recognize and realize that there's no better or safer place to be than with the Lord. Come on, somebody say amen. If you haven't been away from God, you, don't, you can't appreciate being with him. If you haven't been down in the dust, you can't appreciate being up in God's blessings. If you've never experienced what it's like to struggle, you will never appreciate what it's like to receive the blessings of God. Sometimes he backs away so we can understand what it means to be near to Christ. Until, until spiritual conversion replaces natural devotion, we will always lack the power that God says we need to have. When Peter was converted, look at what he said on the day of Pentecost. When Peter was converted, look at what he said on the day of Pentecost. Then Peter said to them, what's the first word he said? Amen. Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, why did Peter say repent? Because Peter had to repent. Until you repent, you will never be able to help somebody come to the point of repentance. God had that sermon set for Peter. Peter became a soldier of the cross. He finally embraced the power of God after his repentance, after his conversion. And when Peter was converted, Peter didn't care about who believed or who didn't believe. Heaven's agenda was his mission. And nothing made Satan more angry than the new Peter. When the new Peter came to the forefront, Satan said, wait a minute, I remember him as a, as a cursing fisherman or a guy who always said the wrong thing at the wrong time, but all of a sudden he got his mind synchronized with the heart of God and Peter really became a threat. You know, there's nothing more profound, well, let me rephrase it, there's nothing more of a benefit to heaven than a person with a big mouth that just can't stop talking about Jesus. Like the pastor and the deacon one day stood at the door as people were leaving the church and there was a lady that had joined the church not too long before that. She could not stop talking about Jesus. And one of the elders started getting frustrated. 
He said to the pastor, she's always talking about Jesus. And the pastor said, give her some time. She'll be, become just like one of us. <laughs> if your joy is not talking about Jesus, you're in trouble. Doesn't matter where you are, find ways, creative ways to share Jesus with people. I was on the elevator yesterday at my hotel. I went to pick up my wife. I dropped her off at the salon to get it together. That's what women from New York do. They get it together. And on my way down in the elevator, I was singing a song, warming my voice up for tomorrow night, for last night, and forgetting that I get off on the first floor. I was so into my song, it only had gone one floor, and I was walking out, and I realized, oh, it's the third floor. Let me get back on. And a, and a young lady walked on. She had an all black. She had on a white face mask. And, oh, I said, this is the third floor. I, th I, I said, I was singing so loud. I thought this was the first floor. She said, was that you singing? She said, what a wonderful song. What were you singing? I said, well, a song I wrote. I'm going to share with some young people tonight at a church nearby and uh, talk to them about trials and how to give their lives to Jesus. And she said, that was wonderful. And when she looked at me, she said, oh, when I looked at you, I realized I forgot my glasses because I had my glasses on then. When she looked at me on the front of her mask, on the front of her, you know, mask, she had Gnostic Church of Satan. But when I was talking to her about Jesus, she seemed really interested. I said, what's that on your mask? She said, oh, uh, the Gnostic Church of Satan. I said, are you a member of the Gnostic Church of Satan? She said, yes. You know what my mind says? Opportunity, witnessing opportunity, bam, 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 all the bells and sirens off, tell her about Jesus. So John and Rochelle, I got an email to give to you to follow up because I, I can tell one of two things, either she never met Jesus, but I remember the story in the book of Acts, the devil sent a demon-possessed girl after the apostles, and you know what? That demon-possessed girl harassed the apostles until they cast the demons out of her, and a formerly demon-possessed girl became the first convert to the New Testament church. So when you meet somebody, you got to look for those opportunities. God sets them up. So I said, honey, I got her email. And I said, no, I said to her, the Gnostic Church of Satan. Now I have knowledge of what that is. I said, well, I'd like to find out more about that. How would I find out? She said, well, here's my email. Here's my name. So I got the email and the name to give to both of you so you can follow up. Because if, <laughs> amen, that's a good candidate. If you, if, you, if you give your life to the devil, you can experience a whole lot more joy when you give your life to Jesus. <laughs> Got to look for those opportunities. Lord, you got to be at the place like Peter. You got to be a soldier of the cross, a soldier of the cross. The Bible talked about the life of Peter after his conversion. Notice what it said in Acts chapter 4 and verse 13. His life just took off. He didn't really care who was who and what was what. The Bible says, speaking about Peter and John. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained, they marveled and they realized, here's the crux of the issue, and they realized that they had been with what? Jesus. Spiritual conversion is far more valuable than intellectual connection. You can have it up here, but the longest distance is between the head and the heart when you don't have spiritual conversion. You may have knowledge, but knowledge does not convert. It takes the power of Christ to take you from what's in your head. And as my wife and I are studying, wisdom and understanding is what, is what Proverbs always talks about. You may have knowledge, but without wisdom and understanding, it'll be up here. And you may be highly informed, but never transformed. When Peter got transformed... He understood there was no greater cause than the cause of heaven. And nothing brings greater concern to the forces of darkness than a spirit-filled Christian. That's who Peter was. He was so spirit-filled that he could discern Satan's agents wherever they were. Remember when the New Testament church was being formed and people were making pledges to the New Testament church. God gave Peter insight. Let me say something. 
Can I say something? Thank you for permission. What many of you don't understand is the Lord sometimes informs the pastor about what's going on in your life even when you don't tell him what's going on in your life. And so when the pastor sees you, like I was standing in line once at a convenience store in the mountains of Northern California, and I was in line behind an elder from another town 50 miles away. He drove 50 miles to buy beer. Didn't think anybody would see him 50 miles away from where his church was. But God has a way of following people. <laughs> so he's 50 miles away from his church in another town, so he drove 50 miles to buy his Budweiser. And it just so happened that God said, John, go to the store. Go to that store. Go to, go to that checkout line in 15 seconds. And there I was standing behind this elder. I said, hello, elder so-and-so, and he turned around and if he could have left earth <laughs> at that very moment, he would have yelled, beam me up, Scotty. <laughs> his look was so turbulent that I didn't have to say a thing about what was in his cart. I didn't see him for six months. I think he went into rehab. That's how God does it. And when Peter was converted, the Lord synchronized Peter. There was a couple that came to his church that had their minds in one place and their finances in another. And the devil had gotten into their hearts. And when they came before Peter, I'm talking about his journey. Peter said to them, to Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? The Lord had given Peter insight into the life of Ananias and his wife Sapphira. God does that. I've had instances where the Lord told me things about other church members. And they come to my office and they're telling me one side of the story. And I ask them about the, about the other side of the story. And then they say, how do you know? I said, God told me yesterday. Well, how do he tell you? That's between me and God. Sometimes God does that. But Peter came to the point, what am I saying? When your life is in the will of God, he will inform you. He will guide you. He will direct your footsteps. Peter became that individual so connected with Christ that the devil started noticing Peter. And then Peter began preaching. He said in one part of, the, on one part of his itinerary in Acts 5 and verse 29, Peter and the apostles said, we ought to obey God rather than men. Let me tell you something today, brethren. In 2020, I know I'm dating the sermon, but the world is becoming so dark on one side that this is the hour that Christians ought to shine on the other side. And so when people begin to challenge what you believe and try to get you to back down, what you simply say is, we ought to obey God rather than man. And if you want to stand up and shout, you could do that too. Praise God for that. We ought to obey God rather than man. I am so glad that the elections are almost over. <laughs> Eventually, I said to my wife, I don't care who wins because I didn't trust, I, I didn't give my life to the 32nd or the 33rd or the 34th, the 35th. I didn't give my life to the 41st and 42nd, 43rd, 44th, 45th. I gave my life to Jesus. When the men were changing, my life was still in God's plan. Somebody said, are you Democrat or Republican? I said, no, I'm independent of earth. <laughs> I've already cast my vote on the side of Christ. Amen, church? Amen. I had to put that in there. I had to put that in there because you guys were given the former president stress while he was trying to figure out, did Arizona go for me or against me? <laughs> you should say, when they ask, no, no, Arizona's for Christ. Not against anybody. At least this church is. God informs us we ought to obey God rather than man. However, the turning point in Peter's life became the turning point in Satan's agenda. You know, the devil could follow you. And if you have a humdrum Christian life, the devil says, eh, one person here, one person there, I'm not so 
concerned about him. One person here, one person there. But one day, God got a hold of Peter's prejudice. Gave him a vision in Acts chapter 10 of some unclean animals. And said, Peter, go ahead and have a dinner. And Peter said, I've never eaten anything common nor unclean. God was getting Peter past his preconceived ideas about other races. And other people that didn't believe like he believed. I believe that until we put down our differences, we can never appreciate the unity that we have in Christ. So God gave Peter a vision, and God was getting him ready for the, for the evangelistic series of his life. And God sent Peter. God sent Peter to the house of Cornelius. And in the house of Cornelius, the entire family of Gentiles accepted the gospel of the kingdom, and the devil said on that day, that's it. I'm done. And he increased the heat. He hired more assassins. He hired more evil angels. And he said, this is it. I'm drawing the line. This is done. I'm, I'm going after Peter. Now, well, let's go to the book of Acts chapter 12. This is where the sermon begins. That was all preamble. <laughs> Look at Acts chapter 12. This is where the sermon begins. After the conversion of Peter, you find these words in Acts chapter 12. After the conversion of Cornelius and his entire family and friends that were saved, this is what the word now means. Now, about that time, Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass some from the church. Then he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. The devil was taking out all of Peter's co-workers, cutting them down, imprisoning them, killing them. One by one, he was working his way to Peter. What happened to James? I, I heard he got beheaded. What happened to John? <sighs> I don't know. Peter probably said, was it both of them? Yeah. But what? A, and I can imagine at that very moment, Peter probably said, he's coming after me next. He's coming after me next. Let's see what he did. Look at verse 3 and verse 4. And because he, that is Herod, saw that it pleased the Jews, well, that's a whole sermon right there, he proceeded further to do what? To seize Peter also. Now it was during the days of unleavened bread. So when he had arrested him, when he had arrested him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four squads of soldiers to do what? To keep him, intending to bring him before the people after Passover. If you look at verse 4, you say, he delivered him to how many squads of soldiers? Do you know how many soldiers that is? Sixteen soldiers. Now, my wife was reading this to me last night, and this added something to my sermon that I never had before. The Lord gave me a further insight. Can you imagine your life as such a threat to the kingdom of darkness that the devil assigns 16 evil angels to stop you? Say, mm, or something. Mm, uh. I mean, that's when you know your life is a threat. The devil said, now we use one angel to get John, one angel to get James, but we need 16 to go after Peter. Because Peter was not only thrown in prison, Peter was not only thrown in prison, but Peter was shackled. Let's understand shackled very briefly. You know, being shackled is an amazing thing. The devil saw the effectiveness of the life of Peter and decided to bind him. Let me give you a side story to help you understand, to sharpen our focus on how our lives can become a threat, how the devil binds us. In the book of Luke, chapter 8 and verse 30, you remember the story when Jesus confronted the Gadarene that had been bound. He was on an island. He was chained. But notice, notice what happened. Notice how many demons the Bible refers to. Look at this. In Luke, chapter 8 and verse 30, look at this. When Jesus confronted the Gadarene, the demons that were in this man, he said to him, what is your name? And he said, legion, because how many? Many demons had entered him. This man was not being held by one demon. 
So the devil didn't send one demon after Peter. He sent 16, as the story talked about, 16 soldiers. He bound them. He was in prison behind three gates, 16 soldiers guarding. He was chained to the soldiers who were chained to the wall, who was chained to Peter. Peter couldn't move. But let me say something. When it seems like the devil has you bound, that's about the hour that God is going to show you who he really is. Man's extremities are God's opportunities. I, can t I, could, I, could, I could end that sermon and just tell you about our life. How God in moments of blessing, in difficult hours, how God had stepped through in our lives in many, many ways. My wife and I are thinking about writing a book called just Blessings. When you come to the end of your rope, that's when you realize that God has a whole lot more rope when you come to the end of your provision, you come to the realization that God has more provision. As Ellen White says, there's a place she talks about in vision. She says, when the saints of God are entering the new Jerusalem, to the left, she says, they see a room that's filled with all kinds of articles. And in the vision, she says, the saints ask, what are all those gifts? And the reply is, oh, those are the blessings that I want to give my children, but they never asked. I'll tell you, my wife and I ask. You know who we ask? We ask the Lord. Can I give that example, the most recent example, honey? Just a few days ago, Sunday, I'm working on this project for the Three Angels Messages booklets, and it was my responsibility to raise the funds to get the books printed. You know, three Abian was sending them out, but it was my responsibility. I got to the end of my rope and I said, you know what? I am not calling folk to ask for money. Doesn't it irritate you when somebody calls you to ask for money? Come on, say amen. You know it's true. You got five dollars? How about somebody calling you? You got twenty thousand dollars? Well, that was my responsibility. So I said, I can't do that anymore. I'm not calling anybody to ask for money. I'm not doing it. So my wife said, So what are you gonna do? We are eight thousand dollars short to get these books printed. I said, honey, let's pray. And on Sunday, I prayed. I said, Lord, this is your project. If you wanted to go out, you provide the need. I'm not asking anybody. I'm putting it in your hands. So on Monday morning, my wife says, John, what are we going to do? I said, I already did it yesterday. I put it in God's hands. Amen? Amen? Now, why is that important? Some people say to you, well, I can't help you, but I'll just pray for you. If that's all you can do, praise God for that. We minimize the power of prayer when we say, all I could do is pray for you. Now, let's translate that. Are you ready for the translation? If all you could do is talk to the most powerful person that has ever existed in my behalf, I'm settled with that. Y'all need some caffeine. If you're going to talk to the man that owns it all in my behalf, I'm good with that. Amen? If you're going to talk to the guy that throws planets together and builds galaxies on his day off, I'm all right with that. All I can do is pray for you. Well, who's going to ask? Pray to God. So I asked the Lord on Sunday. On Monday, my wife said, what are you going to do? Honey, I already did it on Tuesday. I was tempted. I picked up my phone, but I put it back down because I said, Lord, I'll put this in your hand. I'm not taking it back. And on Wednesday, somebody texted us, and they said, you know, something amazing happened on Monday. I said, what? They said, the stock market just exploded. Come on, rich people, say amen. <laughs> the stock market exploded, and my stocks went up. And they said, at that very moment, the Lord impressed me to go to the bank because he said to me, Pastor Loma King has a need. And they called... And they called and they said, the Lord told us to put aside $8,000 for you. And my wife and I looked at each other and almost swallowed the kitchen table. <laughs> because that's exactly what we needed. Amen, somebody? You see, what you don't understand, what we don't understand is God woke up this morning and painted the sky blue for Arizona. <laughs> Spray painted that for us. Come on, somebody, help me out. So we don't serve a God who has 
low supplies or is running about running out of supplies during COVID-19. No, no. God will supply all of our need. The Lord said to this man, you need help. And no matter how many demons in your life, one thing we must always remember. Here it is. We got to not downplay the power of prayer. He said, so he said to them, this kind can come out by nothing but what? Prayer and fasting. And some of the reasons why some of us are still bound is we don't understand the power of prayer. Getting on our knees, talking to the Lord, talking to the only one that can resolve the issues of our lives. Amen, somebody. So they put Peter in prison. They put him in there. Why did they put him in there? Here's what the Bible says in Acts 12 and verse 5. Peter was therefore kept in prison. But what kind of prayer? Say it together. What kind of prayer? Constant prayer. You ever pray for somebody constantly? Is there somebody in your family you're still praying for? Don't stop praying because constant prayer is like constant rain. It softens the heart like rain softens the dry ground. Don't stop praying. I've been praying since my sister was 16. She's now 65. I'm praying for her to come back. And God has spared her life through the World Trade Center disaster. She was a firefighter down at the World Trade Center. You know why she didn't go earlier? Because God changed her mind the night before. Why? Because her brother was praying for her. She would have gone early that morning and died with all of her comrades. But during the night... Four o'clock at night, the Lord said to my sister, don't go to work at 8 o'clock, go to work at 10. And she said that single decision saved her life as her other comrades at the base of the World Trade Center died. You may wonder why God is keeping your relatives that have not given their lives to him alive yet, because God is trying to work out their salvation. Don't stop praying. Constant prayer. They were praying for Peter. What happened? What happened? Look at verse 6. And when Herod was about to bring him out, that night Peter was sleeping. John, that's another sermon right there. You could preach a sermon. Peter was sleeping. The only time, are you ready for it? The only time you can be sleeping if you're in prison bound to soldiers is if you still know that Jesus is ahead of the soldiers. Amen, Amen somebody. We fear men so much. I mean, look at the situation. He's behind three gates, 16 soldiers watching every entrance, two soldiers chained to him. They're chained to the wall. He's chained to them. If he moves an iota, they know it. What's Peter doing? Well, it's a good time to get a good rest. <laughs> kind of like Daniel in the lion's den. Wow, it's really nice in here. Never been this close to Kimba the white lion. How you doing, Kimba? I'm doing fine. I'm just waiting for the next delivery. Amen. God said to the lions, no, 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 no. They're not on the menu. You see what I liked about the lions in Daniel's day? The lions only ate what God put on the menu. And Daniel wasn't on the menu. That's why he was able to go into the lion's den, into their kitchen, and they said, man, you're not on the menu. Why are you down here? Well, I just came to say, how you doing? So would you move, move over? I'm tired. Could I sleep on your mane? Sure, go right ahead. That's the good God. What do you say? So Peter's sleeping. He's bound. He's bound. He's there. But I tell you, friends, being bound in the sight of man and being bound in the sight of God is completely different. People might think your life is falling apart. But God is still working it out. People might look at where you are saying, I don't even want to ask them how things are going. There's some people that come to church on Sabbath morning. They said, well, how are you doing? And they tell you their whole life story. Oh, see, when I was 16, see, what happened was, and like you want to get to Sabbath school, and they want to tell you their whole life. You know anybody that likes to tell you the same story over and over again? Don't look around. But there's some people that want to tell you the same story. I heard that story. Remember you told me that last Sabbath when I asked you the same thing? They, want, I hear, they love war stories. That's why some people don't want to be converted. Because being converted means you got to give up your war stories. That's why the Lord asked the man at the pool of Bethesda, do you want to be made well? Now you know what that means? I'm ready for you now. You know what that means? When the Lord delivers you, you can't keep repeating the old somebody done me wrong song. 
But some people are comfortable to allow that to become their identity. Some people want to be identified by all their scars and what happened to them when they were kids and what happened to them when they were growing up. Let me tell you something. Somebody told me once, he said, John, you should be in insane asylum. <laughs> Maybe I am, but I don't know it. <laughs> now, why do they say that? They said, all the stuff you went through, your mother abandoned you at three months old. You, don't know, you didn't know who your dad was, when you was until you were 13. You had to raise yourself. All the stuff you've been through, you should be unbalanced. But you know why I'm not? Because I got a friend in Jesus. God can take those who are abandoned and turn them into preachers. God can take, I'm going to say this right, God can take an illegitimate child and make him a son of God. I can't stand that phrase, illegitimate child. I hate it. You know why? Because the child didn't do anything. The parents are illegitimate. I know you're thinking about it. That child came into the world just the way God intended. So every place I go, I say, I'm not an illegitimate child. I'm a son of the most high God. But Peter is in prison now. And Herod is intending to bring him out and make an example of him. And at the moment when it seems like it's all going to fall apart, I just love Jesus for this. At the moment when it seems like it's all going to fall apart, somewhere in glory, God says, uh, Gabriel, I got an assignment for you. What assignment? Well, you know, remember that fisherman that I talked about before? Yeah, the one that you kept watching? Yeah, he's giving me gray hair. Yeah, that one. He's in jail. Could you go get him for me? Sure. I, I, I got it. And now we go to verse 7. I got it. Look at this. Now behold. Oh, I love those two words. Now behold. Like the word but. A transition between what was happening and what is about to happen. Now behold. An angel of the Lord stood by him. I don't know, something's happening to me today. It's not happening to you. I want an angel of the Lord to stand by me. Come on, what about you? I'm on my way home. I see two people. An angel of the Lord is standing by that brother, standing by that sister. An angel of the Lord, the Bible says, stood by Peter. There is Peter snoring his brains out, and the angel is right there. Hmm. He hasn't changed. What happened now? And the Bible says, and... A light shone in the prison. When Ellen White talked about this, she says, Peter saw the light, but the guards didn't see it. That tickles me. God could bring stuff to you your enemies won't even see. What are you talking about? Well, it's a revelation for me, not for you. And he struck Peter on the side and raised him up. That's what the Lord does when he comes to us. He comes to us in the darkest places of our lives. He comes to us in the moments where we're bound, and he raises us up. And he said to him, what did he say to him? Arise how? Arise how? Quickly. Those two words are the difference between a humdrum life and a life that's turned on by the Lord. Some people hear God calling them, but they won't get up quickly, and they stay in their humdrum prison always complaining about their situations that keep them bound. If you arise quickly, you'll have a Peter converting experience. And when he arose, what did the Bible say? And his chains what? His chains what? Fell off. The evidence of freedom in Jesus. You don't know what part of the sermon applies to me, but I've gone over my story so many times already in this sermon. Peter has become my new favorite character in the Bible. I said to my wife a number of years ago, I found a new person in the Bible that's just like me. His name is Peter. Because I could talk for five hours. You want a five-hour sermon? I could do it. <laughs> not really. I'm not going to do that. But I've seen the Lord in my life say to me, John, this is the time to move. And when I listen to the voice of God, the thing that I was struggling with, the thing that was binding me, and let me be very real with you, pastors even struggle. Some people think that pastors don't. As a pastor, 
I'm always disheartened when I hear that another pastor has left the ministry for one reason or the other. You know why? Because they don't feel they can come to church and ask for another member to pray for them. Because they're supposed to have all the answers. I was doing a prayer meeting once at my church in, Fear, in um, Thompsonville, Illinois. During a trial in my life, my wife and I were going together. Not because of us, but the devil always tries to harass those that are working for the kingdom. And I was in prayer meeting. And all these people that were there were getting ready for three ABN camp meeting. And they were waiting for me to just really give them a good devotional that Wednesday night. Just before camp meeting began. And I said to them, I said, you ever feel like when you're on your way to church, you just want to drive by and just keep on going and not stop? I said, that's how I feel right now. I didn't want to be here tonight. I need y'all to pray for me. Could you pray for me? And they gathered around me and prayed for me. We ought to be able to go to our brothers and sisters and know that they are less concerned about what is wrong in our lives and more concerned about putting the power of God's prayer in our lives. Come on, somebody, say amen. But one of the reasons why we can't find freedom in so many times is because when somebody comes to you and tells you what they're struggling with, you tell somebody else who tells somebody else who tells somebody else, and quickly the conversation becomes what's wrong with them than what's wrong with you. Even the food police. It's not in my notes, but I got to talk about the food police. <laughs> you go to fellowship lunch and they say, what's in that? Is that vegan or vegetarian? And the problem is not what you're eating. The problem is what's eating them. No amens are necessary. Void, we're prohibited by law anyway. Some people are more concerned about what you're eating than what's eating them. Some people are more concerned about clean, whole, clean colons and not concerned about corrupt hearts. Not in the sermon. No extra charge. But when the Lord came to Peter, he didn't say to Peter, now what did you do to get here? Now how did you find yourself in trouble? He just simply said two words, arise how? Quickly. And when Peter listened, the chains that were binding him fell off. And when you read the story in Acts of the Apostles, Ellen White says, when the chains fell off, they fell off silently. The guards didn't even hear it. They were not even disturbed in the least. You see, brethren, you can't face your future with your life chained to the same place. You cannot face a future with your prayer life chained to the same old place, your study life chained to the same old bad habits, your spiritual life chained to the same old humdrum way that you live a Christian life. Somewhere along the way, you got to pray for the chains that are holding you in some area of your life to be broken. Amen, somebody. Why is that important? Look at this quotation from Prophets and Patriots and Prophets. This is powerful. I was just given this quotation a few, about a week ago. It is important to believe God's word and to act upon it how? Promptly. While his angels are waiting to work for us. Evil angels are ready to contest every step of advance. And when God's providence bids his children go forward, when he is ready to do great things for them, what happens? Satan tempts them to displease the Lord by hesitation and delay. He seeks to what? Kindle a spirit of strife or to arouse murmuring or unbelief and thus deprive them of the blessing that God desires to bestow. What does when they hesitate? She says, God's servants should be what? Minutemen, ever ready to move as fast as his providence opens the way. And delay on their part gives time for Satan to work to do what? To defeat them. Brethren, when the Lord says, get up, what, do you, what should you do? Get up. When the appeal is made, don't talk about anybody. Don't say, should I respond to God? No, that's your moment. That's between you and God. When God says it's time to move, move. When God said don't move, don't move. When God says get up, get up. Because God is saying on the other side of your response, there's a blessing waiting that I cannot give you if you hesitate. And when you read that story, when you can't get to the light 
God will bring the light to you. Some of you think that your relatives don't have the light. Well, you're praying for them, and God is bringing the light to them. Look what the angel did. Look at verse 8 of Acts chapter 12. We're almost done. Then the angel said to him, that is to Peter, what do we do, what? Gird yourself and tie on your sandals. And so he did. God was about to take Peter on an excursion that he would not even believe. And he said to him, what? Put on your, put on your garment and do what? Follow me. Put on your garment and do what? Follow me. When the Lord breaks our chains, he instantly frees us. But I don't want you to miss this. He instantly frees us, and then the journey to complete freedom begins. I want you to get that. Because some people gave up alcohol, but they haven't given up cigarettes yet. I always like to meet Christians and say, you know what? I gave up alcohol. So what else do you need to give up? Don't boast about what you gave up. Pray for the Lord that will pray that the Lord will take you through everything you need to give up. Amen, somebody. Don't even boast about the freedom. Because the freedom is not what you have done. The freedom is what Christ has done. So put your sandals on and follow me. And when you follow the Lord, notice what happens. Look at this. You like this passage. Follow me and I will make you what? We always like the fish part. But I want you to get this. Follow me and I'll make you. You know what that means? If you don't follow the Lord, he can't make you. Why is that my testimony? When the Lord found me, I was a gambler, a partier, a pool hustler. I was the disc jockey in the clubs in Manhattan, in the World Trade Center, in Brooklyn, in the house parties, the club parties. I was the guy that needed to be made. But it was not until I put that down that God was able to make me, take me from a gambler to a preacher. Come on, somebody, help me out today. God can take you from a person on the streets to a kingdom of the Most High God. God can turn your life around from a corporate executive to the head pastor in, in Arizona. Amen, somebody. I know where John was. He knows where I was. God can do things in your life farther than you can ever imagine. But until you get up and follow the Lord, they'll never happen. It's like being, it's like Arizona. I think in Arizona it gets hot out here. Does it get hot out here? Is that an understatement? <laughs> hot. They told me that this was one of the hottest years that you ever had. Now, just put this picture together. It's 120 degrees, which is not an imagination for you. And there's a big community pool, and everybody's in the community pool just swimming, and, oh, they're so alive, and they feel so relieved, and they're just so exacerbated with joy. And here you are on a 120-degree day with a coat on and a hood. You got on gloves. And all you're doing is walking around the edge of the pool wondering, why are those people in there so happy? Why are they making all that noise? Why do they look so free? You know, brethren, that's how some of us are. The Lord is saying, you'll never know how good it is until you dive into this relationship. <laughs> I hope I didn't waste my story on you. Take off that coat. Take off those gloves. When you dive into the relationship that the Lord has for you, you'll understand he can make anybody. God can make anything out of nothing. Somebody once says, God has done so much with so little for so long that he can do anything with nothing. That's my story. Praise God for that. Praise the Lord for that. But then the Lord began to do something that Peter didn't even imagine. Look at the next verse. Verse 9. I'm on my last page already. That's disappointing. <laughs> the change, the unimaginable change. Verse 9 is powerful. So he went out and followed him. This is your story. So he went out and followed him. And this is powerful. And did not know that what was done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. If you're listening on the radio, there's nothing wrong with the cassette, the CD. You know, brethren, can I testify for a brief moment? 
no one could have told me when I was in the pool halls of Brooklyn that I would be a preacher. There, would, there are days I have to wake up because I think I'm seeing a vision. When I know where I was, what I was, what I did, how I lived, my journey, when you turn your life over and give your life to Christ, young folk, God is going to do the unimaginable. And we don't understand that until we're sitting in first class on, on an airline that we didn't even pay for first class on. We don't understand that until God is sending us to one country or the other and treating us like royalty. You, let, me, let me tell you something. My wife and I, you may not have been here last night, so I've got, I have to insert this. My wife and I have been to more places in the world and never had to pay a dime to go there. We came back from Africa, I think it was last year. We were in Nakuru, Kenya, in Africa. Did not know that while my wife was there, she had walking pneumonia. Didn't know it. We got to the airport, beginning our journey back home. We were on a luxurious airline, an Arabian airline. They, had, they really know how to do it. First class is like super first class to American Airlines. So we walked up to the desk, and I just, you know, the Bible says you have not because you ask not. So I went up to the ticket agent at the check-in. I said, uh, do you have any upgrades today? Knowing very well that I couldn't afford an upgrade. But I just asked. You know, she said to me, she said, well, actually, we are processing upgrades today to first class, and you'll be the first on the list. I went over to my wife and said, honey, they said, we first on the list. <laughs> and this is Etihad Airlines. They really have first class. So let's wait. Sometimes you got to hold your breath while God is blessing you. Come on, help me out. Because what about, what's about to happen, you don't believe it's going to really happen, but you're seeing it unfold. So we're standing back. She said, now stand to the side while all the other passengers are going in. And if there's any seats remaining, we'll call your name. So that's faith. Sometimes you got to stand back and let God work through it. You got to wait on the Lord. So there we are standing on the side. And God every now and then gives you a glimpse of how the blessing is going to happen. Because one of the guys behind the counter came over and he put a first class sticker on our luggage. I said, well, at least our luggage will be in first class. <laughs> <laughs> and we waited, you know, looking like first class people. You got to look like you belong in first class sometimes. <laughs> you can't be standing around like, you know, I need to be in first class. You got to stand like a, oh, they're going to put us in first class. Stand up, stand up like you look like first class, you know. <sighs> I'll be in first class. So standing up like it, in my mind, I was already there before I got there. Sometimes you got to be in God's blessing before the blessing gets there. So everybody's going in, and my wife and I are looking at, are we going to get on this plane? After a while, you know, you start imagining, you start going from a dream to a nightmare. Are we going to get on this flight at all? And they came over to us, and they said, Miss Angela Lomacay, Mr. John Lomacay, when you get on, go to the left, all the other jelly beans go to the right. <laughs> you go to the left. We got, <laughs> we got on the plane. When we got on Ithiad Airline, and we started going to the left, we said, now we ain't never seen first class like this. Guy came up to us, said, sir, let me escort you to your seat. See, God does stuff for you. Come on, help me out, somebody. You guys act like you've been to heaven already. <laughs> When God does stuff for you, you got to stand back and take it. It's like, honey, act like you've been in first class before. And so he, so he escorted us to the seat and has a, 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 not a tissue, but an actual linen napkin over his arm. Can I, can, I, can I get you something to drink? Treating us like royalty. Amen. Because we are, when we're in Christ, we are a royal priesthood. Can I get, I said, I'd like to have a, um, I'm trying to sound first class. You got any, you got any hot chocolate? <laughs> he, said, he said, maybe I could include a, a, a muffin with that or maybe some, uh, uh, some jam with that. You know, they don't say jelly. Poor people say jelly. They say jam. When you're wealthy, it's jam. Would you like a, would you like a, a, a truffle with that? 
yeah, what's a truffle? Yeah, whatever it is, a sound could get me a truffle. <laughs> and we enjoy this first class experience. It's like, and it says, uh, by the way, here's the remote. It has 27 different positions for the seat. 27. Is there any eject buttons? Okay, I'll be fine then. <laughs> just show me the eject button. I won't press that one. He said, now, if you'd like to sleep straight out, just hit this button. If you want to be at any angle. And it, it also has uh, uh, all the positions. And I'm already tall. So John would have loved this because he said, it doesn't matter how tall you are, you'll fit. Now, God don't, I'm going to say this like they say in Brooklyn, God don't bless you just to bless you. He blesses you for a reason. We found out after that flight, after we got back home, that the doctor says, your wife had walking pneumonia. The best thing she could get is rest. God knew she had walking pneumonia. He didn't give us first class to give us first class. He knew that my wife needed rest. And you can't rest when the guy sitting next to you is sleeping on your shoulder. So God gave her a seat so she could sleep for seven hours. Straight out, after we got all the meals we needed, the television was huge. The food was good. And every time they gave us new food, they changed the color of the lighting. So my first meal was a purple light. My next meal was an amber light. And my final meal was a red light. But God does it first class. Come on, somebody. That's why Peter said, when God did that, he thought he saw a vision. He thought he saw a vision. But now let's get to the end of the story. Because you guys keep making me change my story. <laughs> look at verse 10. Now, Peter's following him now, but Peter's not awake yet. All right? Look at the next, next verse. When they had passed the what? First and the second guard, they came to the what? iron gate that leads to the city. Oh, that's another sermon altogether, because one day we're going to walk through a pearly gate that leads to the city, which opened to them of its own accord. My brother, when God is in charge, it looks like things are just happening, but God is behind it. Nothing happens on its own accord. When it looks like it's just happening, God is behind it. And they went out and went down one street, and immediately the angel departed from him. I always try to figure that out, but let me say something. Get this. Are you ready for it? Peter, the angel took him past the first gate. That's, boom, you joined the church. Past the second gate, boom. That means you got victory over the little things. But until you get past the iron gates in your life, I can guarantee you that every one of you in this place has an iron gate. Let me talk to you. Because his chains already fell off. Normally we would say, if my chains fell off, I'm free. That's not what the story says. You may, your chains may fall off. Are you ready for us? Your chains may fall off, but you're still in prison. When his chains fell off, he was, where was he? In prison. It was not until the Lord took him past his first gate and second gate. And the very last gate that Peter had to get through to be totally free was the iron gate. Oh, help me, Holy Ghost. Until we are willing to lay down the things that are the iron gates in our lives, we will never get to the place of total freedom in Jesus. The sin that so easily besets us is the iron gate. So to someone it's alcohol, to someone it's promiscuity, to someone it's cigarettes, to someone it's pornography, to someone it's lying, to someone it's cheating, to someone it's not giving God an honest tithe. But let me tell you, brethren, when you finally get past the iron gate, notice what happened to Peter. When he got past the iron gate, he went down one street and immediately the angel departed from him. Why? Last night we read the story. You know why the angel left? Because the angel said, oh, this is powerful. The angel said, Peter don't need my help now because God is going to be with him from this point on. He didn't need to be babysat. Oh, I, I wish I could hear somebody say, I want God to trust me so much that I don't need heaven to babysit me. Heaven could trust me to be on my own. Amen, somebody. 
When heaven has to watch you like a hound dog, you can't be trusted. The angel left Peter because at this point of his conversion, nothing was impossible for his life. And in the book Acts of the Apostles, why did the angel leave him? This is powerful. The angel left him because the angel led Peter back to the familiar parts of the city. Now, what application does that have to us? At one point in your life, you were familiar with Bible studies. But when you got bound, you forgot about Bible studies. At one point in your life, you were familiar with prayer life, but when you got bound, you forgot your prayer life. Let me tell you something. When the Lord frees you, he takes you back to the familiar places of your past. Getting back to God's word, getting back to prayer, getting back to praise, getting back to witnessing. He took him to the amazing things of his past. But look at this. But look at this. As I wind up, this is the closing passage right here. Verse 17. And when Peter had come to himself, what happened to Peter? You know what that means? He woke up. Now, now, everything that happened so far, Peter was still sleepwalking. That's amazing, isn't it? All that he went through was still a sleepwalking experience for him. Now, why is that important to us in 2020? When you come to yourself as a Christian, as a Seventh Adventist Christian, the Lord will finally say, my church is awake. Until Peter came to himself, he was not awake. Look what it says. When Peter had come to himself, what did he say? Now I know for what? For certain that the Lord has sent his angel and has delivered me from the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the Jewish people. You know what? People expect you to fail. But if you trust God, he'll cause that failure to become success. People expect you to turn out to be nothing. I've heard a lot of young people say, my parents told me I'll, I'll amount to nothing. But I'm going to become a pastor. Or I'm going to become a Bible worker. I'm going to give my life to the Lord and com commit myself to ministry. Don't let somebody else decide what you're going to be. Put your life in the Lord's hands and he'll make you what he wants you to be. Amen. How do I know that? How do I know that? He took an abandoned child and made him an ambassador for an eternal kingdom. I know that. That's why I appreciate Peter. But finally, verse 17. When he went to the house where they were praying, finally convincing them that it was him, but motioning to them with his hand to keep silent, he declared to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, the obligation of freedom is this. I appreciate the fact that this church takes this obligation seriously. Go tell these things to James and to the brethren. And he departed and went, where my brethren? To another place. Watch this. The Lord did not just break his chains. He changed his circumstances. And finally, he changed his location. Oh, if we can experience freedom in Jesus, to not go back to the same place that we were before. Can I ask a question? How many of you want to go home to a different place in your spiritual life today? A place of newness, a place of freedom, a place of dynamics. But here's what the servant of the Lord says. She says... In the book Prayer, page 47, paragraph 3, it is a part of God's plan to grant us an answer to the prayer of faith that which he would not bestow did we not ask. So today, as I sing this appeal today, my question to you is, how many of you want those chains broken? Okay, that's the first question. You know what that means? You're saying, Lord, I want you to break whatever's holding me, whatever's binding me. 
But I don't want you just to break what's binding me. I want you to take me out of the prison that's holding me. How many want that today? And finally, I want my life to be different from this day on. I want my life to go to a different place in my prayer life, a different place in my study life, a different place in my relationship with others. I want my life to go to another place. I don't want to be a Seventh-day Adventist that's being tossed back and forth by what's happening in the world. I want to be able to hear the voice of God and the difficulty of my life saying, get up. And, and the angel didn't yell at Peter. He said, get up. He spoke to him softly and he spoke to him tenderly. God can do the same to you today. And as I sing this song, I'm praying that as I sing this song, you'll hear the voice of the Lord saying to you softly and tenderly that he's calling you today. And if he's calling you today and you want that transformation in your life, I want this altar to become a place of prayer today. If that's your desire in your life, for the chains to be broken, the gates to be defeated, and your life to go to a different place beyond this message. As I sing the song, just come on down and I'm going to pray with you. Don't wait for anybody else because this is a secret voice just to you. God is saying just to you. As I sing the song today and God is calling you, just come on down. Pastor and I are going to meet you down here and we're going to pray with you. Listen to the sermon. Listen to the song. Softly and tenderly, Jesus, come and stand, is calling, calling for you and for me. See on the portals, he's waiting and watching. Watching for you and for me. Come home, come home. You who are weary, come home. Earnestly. Tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling, oh sinner, come home. Where are my young people today? God wants to transform your life also. Just come on down. Why should you tarry when Jesus is pleading? Pleading for you and for me. And why should you linger and heed not his mercies? Mercies for you and for me. Wonderful love he has promised, promise for you and for me. Though we have sinned, he has mercy and pardon, his pardon for. Tenderly, Jesus 
is calling earnestly, tenderly, my Jesus is calling. heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. Father, you want to do for us what you did in Peter's life. He was a wreck like we are a wreck. All he could boast about was the number of fish he caught until you made him fishers of men. Father, standing before you today and even in this sanctuary are lives that in one way or another is chained to something. Somewhere there's a chain that's holding them to the memory of a past, to the sin of the past, to a sin that just seems to wake up in the morning when they get up and tries to hold them to the wall without any concern of their future. But today, Father, you've sent me to tell them the God who broke the chains that held Peter is the God who's going to break their chains today. We can't even boast about being good Christians because all you've asked us to do is to get up and follow me and I will be responsible for carrying you through the gates in your life and when you come to the things that hold you so dearly and hold you so intently, I'll break those iron gates. Just follow me. And Father, when we come to ourselves, when we, when we look back at where we were and then we see where we are in Christ, we will also say, as Peter did, this has to be a vision. There is no way that I could become what I have become. But Father, we thank you today that we can become whatever you envision us to become. You can lead us, you can guide us, you can deliver us from our past, you can deliver us from our present, and you can get ready to reveal to us and introduce us to a powerful, magnificent, unbelievable future. I pray for the young people today in this church. Social media has bound them. Whether Facebook or Instagram or TikTok or whatever it is, somebody is bound to that phone. They can't hear the voice of God because there are other voices entering their minds. They become slaves bound to that device. Father, set them free that they may begin to face the eternal book, the book that has freedom in it. Their relationships in this church, their husbands and wives that are not as strong as they need to be, something is binding one of the spouses. Father, break that chain today. Free that husband. Free that wife. Free them that they may have the relationship, the marriage, that will be a glory and an honor to you. Some single folk here today that are looking for love in all the wrong places, help them to see they can only find a divine love as they follow you and your plan. Free them today, Father. Carry them through their gates. Bring them past the iron gates of false, disappointing relationships. And I pray for the leaders of this church. I pray for those who may be going through the gate of pain. They may have lost someone and it's a hard chain to break. Father, help them to know that there's peace and freedom and joy in Jesus. Free them today. Be with my brother John, Pastor Stanton, and his wife Rochelle. Give them wisdom to lead this, this flock of sheep that if the shepherd is not true, they'll all go astray. Empower Camelback to be on the back of the promises of Jesus. And as we leave this sanctuary today, Father, may we know that we don't leave your promises because your promises are sure. May we go into that unbelievable future. But may all the glory go just to you 
In Jesus' name I pray. And all of God's people said, amen, amen and amen. Now, pastors, the pastors are here today. Pastor Stanton, his associates are here today. If there's somebody here today in this, in this crowd that has stood up that may not be a member of this church, and you want to give your life to Jesus today, you want to find out about that journey that Christ has for you, why don't you just raise your hand where you are? I want to make sure that the pastors get information to you. Please just come aside instead of holding. If you've just raised your hand, please just come aside. I want you to meet with the pastors so they can make sure that when you leave here today, that this decision you made is one that will carry you beyond this moment to a more permanent moment. Just go aside. If there's somebody here today that wants to say, I want to go further than just responding to the voice of God, I want my life to be completely transformed. Just meet me on the right side. But right now, I'm going to turn the time over to Pastor Stanton so that maybe whoever is going to close the service will do so. Just pray and just close it. Okay, let's bow our heads. Our gracious Father, we thank you for meeting with us today. We thank you for the promise that waits outside those doors. We know your presence will keep us while we're here, but carry us to the unbelievable, glorious, free abundant walk that can only come as we follow you. And finally, like Peter, may it be our privilege to one day hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. God bless you.